Bienvenido a Toby's Arts Performed Podcast. En este, esta plataforma, Toby se re relacionará con varios artistas y consumidores de arte acerca de sus pasiones y intereses. Hello everyone, and welcome to the 20th episode of Toby's Arts Performed Podcast. I am your host, Toby. In this second part of Seb's interview, we return to the ideas of live art versus performance art. Also, we digress into the realm of social cleansing by what Seb calls the local government's art washing or the co-opting of grassroots art to justify gentrification. We also go back to his performance, La Santa Muerta, leading us back to the issues of the place of capitalism in Mexico and Mexican migrants in America. As a brief reminder, Seb is performing at the Camden People's Theatre on the 17th of March, along with other artists and performers, so please look up the Facebook link here or the Camden People's Theatre website for details. <laughs> On your website. Okay. That needs an update. Mm. Yeah. Oh, and, in, and your Facebook page as well. <coughs> good. Um, I saw um, there's a project you did be behind closed doors. Yes. Can you can you talk about that? Because you've got a couple of videos, and I get an, get an idea of what it is, but I can't still can't quite tell what it is mm -hmm. so behind closed doors is um i know this one because i've just 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 done it um <coughs> particip participatory audio tour um that's meant to be kind of site generics so it's as opposed to site specific which is making a piece of performance for you know the olympic park Site generic is when you're taking sites that you can find um, in that, that exist in other places, like a telephone box or a swimming pool. Um, and I started making a piece back in 2016 as part of a residency in Birmingham, um, where which looked at a space of a street, a supermarket. Uh, CCTV camera, a new development, um, and kind of uh, hoarding, which is a kind of the, um, on an, on the building work of new development. It's the the boards that are put up around to protect the public from excavation works and um, etc. So I made that piece. It was very scratch. Um, part of my MA they had a module looking at public space and I thought great okay I've already got something why don't I redevelop the scratch into this work in progress um, and I made it uh, this work in progress in um, Stratford Shopping Centre the old shopping centre not Westfield Westfield is too police yeah I recognise yeah. you <laughs> um, would that have been a problem doing it in Westfield? yes because it's private land um, the it's very intensely policed um, and you yeah, you can be fined and sent to court if you're doing anything untoward in that space so what were you doing that might have been well that that's what the, that's what the piece is about um, oh okay so uh, where is Stratford old Stratford shopping centre uh, the mall is still council property it's still this kind of interesting grey space of being public but also private space mm. so it has kind of its own security but you know they don't they, they don't really care and it's um and it's yeah it's it's interesting as a space so um the piece was looking at the kind of role of the voice uh, about hearing voices um both as like auditory hallucinations which is something i use I um, used to suffer from more when I was younger, less really? so now, yeah. Not not in a kind of very extreme <laughs> case, um, but, yeah, to that degree of um, hearing voices that were not necessarily there, or of people who were not in the room or in the, in the space. Mm. But um, coupled with that, looking at uh, voices, people um, kind of affected by gentrification and regeneration. So I've gone through a lot of kind of like 
um, or history archives um, and thinking about the role of like mental health within um, the process of uh, social cleansing, uh, urban mm-hmm. redevelopment. So it's a walk that the audience arrive to me in a cafe, um, they greet me, and they get given these dictaphones, um, which means they can both listen to the pre-recorded track, which gives them instructions of where to go, and they can also record their own responses to that, um, which is quite a different way of looking at the audio tour, which is normally, you just li- you're the passive listener yeah. listening, and you're uh, being told what to do. Um, and I'm quite interested in this role of how far can you push an audience to do something in that sense of how far do you do what the voices tell you to do. Mm. Um, which I think is quite an interesting critique about the audio tour and hearing voices. So the audience set off with me and we go for this walk through the, the, um, through the mall and it's looking at different... They're, they're asked to follow different people, uh, public, um, and think about what's happening inside their head. So they have to cheer as they're walking. We split <coughs> off. So I, I I start talking to them in in their head, um, saying you know find somebody else um, in the mall, uh, just just from looking at the back of their head and just kind of follow them, see where they go, um, and then the kind of the narrative splits off and they have to look at different they get dif- different choices. They either um, have to find a CCTV camera that they don't like. Um, or they have don't to go like. that they don't like, as <laughs> 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 opposed to the ones they do like. And there's um, an interaction in a public uh, public toilet. Um, very few people did that once. A shame. It's quite. It's always quite interesting. Um, no, well, it's, strange, <laughs> it, it's strange going into a public toilet yeah. because it's how. I mean, how do you interact with people and why do you interact with people? <clears throat> Usually, you don't. Yeah, it's very much yeah. not about about that. Um, <clears throat> I think the the the, the uh, experience in the, in the public to- toilet was looking at the role of it was kind of uh, looking at the role of, of of the cleansing of social cleansing, looking at this, this this the process of decanting, which is of the phasing out of different groups of people within a community over a period of time, yeah, and how people the na- like the same the languages of waste are the same um, that are used for people. Who are living in a certain area um, oh, okay. by councils? So I was interested in kind of having an experience in a toilet and listening about that, and like having yeah. that kind of um, associative um, relationship between what you're listening to and what you're you're doing uh, in well, the it's toilet. In, it's interesting seeing the the change in in um, in Stratford over the years. Okay, yeah, yeah brought, you're local. Been, literally been. Yeah, and you have seen it all from like 40, 42 years ago. So you you still get a lot of the same people in certain areas, but then you have other other people moving in. And I mean, it's when you when I think of gentrification, I don't think of Stratford, but I, no. it kind of yeah. there is an aspect of gentrification, but it's different to places like Dalston, yeah, or Shoreditch, or. Mm. Um, um, Islington and stuff. Um, there's more of a, a corporate element. Yeah, exactly. Here. Which is, I mean, not that there's not in yeah. in those other places, but it's it's more at the forefront, <laughs> isn't it? Particularly with Stratford. So I moved to Stratford in 2011, just before the Olympics. Um, just before, just right, before, okay. yeah. Lived through all of that. Wow, that was, uh, and it was my first time living in London. So it was su- it was such a like such an experience um, of being like having moved from yeah like Devon to London and being like yeah this is where I want to be where where do I want to live I want to live east because that's where you know, the artistic stuff is happening mm. and I was really interested in the Olympics and like how artists were responding to it um, so I thought yeah why don't I live in Stratford that, that'll do that I uh, don't regret it and, and like I'm still here now in a way um, yeah. Yeah, and it was just quite odd seeing kind of just how like commercial, how like kind of consumerist Stratford is was um, compared to other parts of London. That I feel, particularly like Hackney Wick, I always find this. I uh, talk about like the area around the Olympic Park being like the moon, and this idea of like um, the Hackney Wick is this kind of like the bright side of the moon. This kind of very, uh, yeah. in a way, kind of gentrified, you could say, regenerated. 
um, with the kind of vibrant artistic community. And then you've got Stratford, which is kind of dark side of the moon. And people saying, oh, there's no artists there. There's no, nothing creative happening here. Yeah. Um, and, it's, <coughs> and then in the middle, you've got this kind of like engineered space, which is the Olympic Park, which... Yeah, it's then it also has its own narrative of displacing communities who are living and working there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting to hear you say, yeah, that you see the gentrification as being something as a different kind. Um, Very much a different to, uh, kind. Is, um, I mean, they, you've got the transport linked in Stratford International, but I think that's that's one of the most important things, and probably the reason we got it. Yeah, um, but interestingly yeah. enough, it's the the Olympic Park. When they talk about the Olympics, they they say about Hackney. They they don't say Newham or Stratford. Exactly. Yeah. But it is. It's not Hackney. It's Stratford. It's, it's quite a few because I mean the park is literally the centre between Tower Hamlets, Hackney, Newham, and a bit of Alston Forest. Yeah. So they're kind. To me, they've always been like these Olympic boroughs. Yeah. Um, but I, I feel Hackney had the most, gets the most, I don't know why did it get the most press? Maybe because it, it's kind of clearer, that sense of because like... Because it is gentrified. Because, because yeah, it it's fashionable. It easy, yeah, it has had that kind of, that media around it would be, this is the fashionable yeah. part of East London yeah. that's gone from being this kind of um, <clears throat> place people wouldn't go to. Um, to now being super you know, bougie and um, having that that influx of artists and wealthy young professionals. Can I I'll pose something to you? What I noticed in a couple of galleries and art spaces that I've been to, um, like London College of Fashion, UAL, yeah, UAL. on Mare Street. Walking through Mare Street, there you see loads of drug addicts and begging on the street and um, ver a very specific kind of ethnic diversity where a lot of black people and mostly black people but also um, other ethnicities and then you go into the art spaces and I wouldn't say it's whitewashed but it's very much yeah. more white middle class so, yeah um, absolutely yeah um, I mean, in some way now that we, I think there's more effort now to try and create a diversity. I mean, I think there's now a lot of, uh, thankfully, um, people like um, the actor Rizwan Ahmed talks about um, Ronson. He is he's a, he's a kind of famous Hollywood actor. He's a British actor, um, and he I talks he, about he's a rapper as well, isn't he? I don't know. He might be. I think I've just seen, I seen think him in films. I'm, was he in Four Lions? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that is a brilliant yeah, film. Yeah, career. that's great. I must, I must check out his music. Um, that he argues that we sh diversity itself is a problematic term, a bit like gentrification. I was listening to um, Anna Minton, uh, who actually teaches at UEL, saying that the word gentrification is also not useful anymore because there's different kinds of gentrification. It's a, become this umbrella term, a bit like live art. <laughs> um, that it, it can be both useful, but also it can lead to lots of problems about it just being used um, uh, too freely and not people kind of interrogating enough to be to look at it more contextually and the fact it has different layers. Um, where was that? Where are we going with that? Live art, identification, representation. So he talks about it should be more about um, representation than diversity because diversity is T still has this narrative of being tokenistic mm. rather than people um, people of colour or, or, or people not even just colour people like people from different abilities yeah. uh, different um, <coughs> different genders social class as well I think social class is something we still are avoiding in in, in, um, in the UK especially in art I think when it comes to diversity we look at ableism racial um, spectrum gender but actually things like class and faith are things that are kind of left out and not and don't and not have a seat at the table yet and not been talked about you think so? I think so yeah okay. I think when it I comes mean I'm to asking like, as someone that's not that familiar with, with, it, yeah. with art in, um, to the degree that you are and other people are. so it's interesting to see, to see. Um, engage with that 
Um, where do you think, in in terms of the absence of faith and social class, mm. where do you think it's lacking? Where do you think it um, art can make up? Can make like, for that? Yeah, I think <coughs> yeah, definitely art can and like pe- artists practice what people are working on can highlight that and you know, to kind of paraphrase Rizwan uh, Ahmed this idea of like representation of the artists themselves taking an onus to not to call that out but to say I am representing I represent the kind of intersection of X, Y, Z um, rather than it being this kind of like top down of the, the people in power the um, Kind of trying to tick boxes to try and get funding to say actually it's the artists themselves who need to say as an artist I hold this belief or I'm coming from this social background um, and that you yeah you need to kind of be accountable to mm. kind of assist me or provide better care or accessibility yeah. for my needs um, than other people's um, what I've noticed how I've come to kind of see that I think comes a lot and then with forms, looking at kind of bureaucracy is quite an interesting way of looking at how what is being spoken about and what isn't. And often in what do you mean in terms of forms? In for, so when you fill out um, <coughs> equality and diversity forms for a lot of things, you in terms of applying for applying for funding or platforms or for performing. Okay. Often when is that the side of performance art? But I'm not. No, I've yeah. heard about people it, don't talk but... about it because it's boring. Or because <laughs> <laughs> usually, because because it's something we kind of almost don't want to do, but we kind of ha- <clears throat> we have to do the kind of the powers that be are um, uh, making us do them because because they, in a way they're kind of gatekeepers to what um, to how work is shown in that sense so for example I applied to something yesterday and as part of the application it's there's the form like you explain your proposal you know 500 words what do you want to do um, what's the title duration um, what what, what materials is involved and then next to it and there's a separate document it's a form which is the equality and diversity form and you have to complete that you have to submit both or else your application is ineligible it can't be completed right Um, and on the eligibility form the questions are about kind of yeah what um racial minority are you or what's your racial demographic um your age um gender what kind of uh, how do you identify in terms of gender so does it and do you have do a disability they, do but they leave you areas to say i don't want to answer this question yes there's a there's um yeah off, sometimes most forms have a well that's uh, not, prefer not to it? say I think that you've got that, that opportunity. Yeah, right. I didn't know. Okay. I'm sure it is. Yeah, yeah it'd be good to see. I've, I've, I've wanted to kind of research what is that? What's the history of these forms? Like, what? What? How do we? Um, where have they come from? Um, what I find difficult in those forms, uh, being a person of um, Latinx of Hispanic origin, is that I can't tick that box. I have to I have to draw my own box in <laughs> on forms <laughs> to make that. it present to represent myself literally well in the context of cultural studies when they put black and Asian or yeah and you're like well um, yes Asian British or other yeah other and you're like wow other, the word other means it's got a totally different meaning in terms of cultural studies now yeah exactly so and we are the other we are the other <laughs> um, so yeah, that's always that's you know I, I've always found that something to I've always taken upon myself to kind of <coughs> you could probably critique like well why why but to me it's important to kind of to to um, highlight that we as a um, as a demographic are not invisible that we we are we can be represented um, and that in, we are here. In so what do you mean by we? As in the um, Latinx Latino. Hispanic community. Right. Um, obviously, a small demographic in comparison to the others, but it should not be ignored or pretended that we're, we're not here. Um, I mean, it's, it's useful in London, particularly, because I think there's higher percentages um, mm. in terms of numbers, like you know, Elephant and Castle and Southwark and Tottenham. Okay. Um, so, are you connected with the 
Hispanic community? In some degree, yes. I think I live near um, the um, Ward End Market, which is like Seven Sisters Market, which has um, had a lot of great press, uh, which is, again, a bit like Elephant and Castle Shopping Centre. It's all shopping centres, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, these contested sites of people wanting to <coughs> knock them down or people trying to, like, people yeah. with local businesses being like, nice, especially um, non-white um people of colours, businesses. So there's a strong Colombian, Peruvian, Ecuadorian community there. Uh, okay. There's campaign groups, um, people trying to protect their businesses. Um, yeah. Because obviously around the businesses, the community exists, people, it's people's family business. People have been there for you know, 10, 20, 30 years. Yeah. Um, and I live, n- n- like it's my local station, so I go there quite a lot, so I'm quite keen to make sure they don't go. Yeah, um, yeah. And that solidarity also with the Elephant and Castle, which is, I think it's more, that's probably more like, I'm amazed it survived so long, because that, that, again, a bit like Stratford, that's had this very rapid regeneration, in some way kind of, I guess, no, probably less commercial, <coughs> still a lot of like um, residential, you know, like Haygate Estate. Yeah. Um, I've been doing a lot of research into particularly Newham, and well, particularly London, and the um, the role of foreign investment in like um, accelerating regeneration, and that coming a lot from the Far East, um, and looking at those kind of the that wave of perhaps what we might see a new wave of um, kind of Far Eastern peoples coming to to London, particularly, mm. um, and like how that will. Affect and communities, where? particularly China. So, <coughs> where we are now, so next to uh, that, along with there's a lot of most of like the kind of, if you think about Newham, there's like the um, from here, the Olympic Park down to Royal Docks, that has been um, cre- uh, been called the Ark of Opportunity by Newham Council. <laughs> um, and they went to Shanghai to a big expo right. um, a couple of years back to kind of sell off vast sections of land um, to particularly Chinese development um, yeah. to build high rises um, to build uh, that because because of the Chinese economy doing so well and so many like nouveau riche people um, and because the restrictions within the UK kind of property market are very different to a lot of Europe and a lot of the world that we foreign investment um it's it's very easy for foreign investors to buy property and land mm. and that a lot of chinese and, and far eastern investors are just yeah kind of buying up mm. space here um for their clientele uh who may never even visit or may never even live in their property yeah because it's it's almost like um it's just an investment it's just an investment yeah, yeah. So, yeah. It's interesting the the the, the combination of um, the the regular tide of immigrants. <laughs> Let me just say this is not a <laughs> this yeah. is not a right wing rhetoric. This is me, just me. So the regular tide of immigrants um, that have made up London f- for its entire history from its very beginnings. So what makes up London today is. A multitude of of immigrants, um, so that you can say there's all there's probably not one single person that exists here that is genuinely like a British Londoner. Yeah, it's, it just doesn't yeah. exist. There's not such a thing. And then you put that against um, the foreign investment. So that you've got mm. the f- the f- the character of the people that make up London being essentially foreign, with the foreign investment that's bleeding London of its riches. Yeah, so I think it it comes back to power. It's like who is in power to be the gatekeeper to say yes, foreign investment is what we what London needs to change. But then, then that having that kind of double-edged sword of then pushing out, of then taking the space of communities that already already here, um, foreign communities, 
communities. So yeah. let's, let's go by the idea of investment. When we say London needs investment, what, what do we mean by what investment? Do we mean money? Do we mean money? Yeah, and on, I guess it probably boils down to that in that sense. Mm. But what is, what's the money being used for? So if you're a local council and you've had your um, government, your annual government investment into the council cut, you then have to, post the recession, kind of 2000, 2008, mm. um, like global recession, uh, was then central government saying, uh, we now no longer have the budgets we had before then to give to infrastructure within a local mm. council. Local councils then have to look at their area and say, what can we what can we sell? How can we make money from what we own? Um, and often that's land, and on the land is social um, social housing. Mm. Um, but then, what is that money then being used for? Kind of then, if if the the local council then sells off that land and pushes out its own um, the people the people who are paying the council tax to <laughs> for their upkeep is then well where how does that money then get reinvested in education or mm. um, healthcare or um, commerce in developing like uh, an indoor market um, decisions are made without people um, necessarily feeling that they are being listened to or that they're seeing any kind of benefit any kind of p- um, positive improvement to what they're being s- to to the kind of the rhetoric of people in power that are imposing and that's 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 why I, I guess I'm using the word regeneration looking at the, the double edged sword of the word regeneration that people are not necessarily anti regeneration it's more who is it for um, mm. and how do people see <coughs> that change so for example um, I'm working with the TMO here at the Tenants Association the what? no Tenants Association for the Car- Carpenters Estate um, oh, that's tenant a, management organisation that's involved with the focus group. <clears throat> they're diff- they're a kind of um, uh, independent campaign group. Right. The TMOs look at is more by residents for residents. So in terms of the question, yeah, right, what yeah. do we mean by investment? But then compare that to the kind of development and evolution of your art yeah. and the people that you're interacting with. Yes, so the art yeah. community, the local communities, yeah. like the social communities to the focus group the tea, um. I think the investment <coughs> I would see investment I would define investment there as um, I guess investment in audience and like who is your audience and who is who is the work you're making for I think that's something that I what I find quite um, quite a clear difference between live art and performance art is that the um, performance art often is not necessarily invested in its audiences. Mm. It, there's, there's often kind of a fourth wall. So, um, Right, okay. In that, so the, fo- the fourth wall, for those uh, for listeners who don't know, um, uh, is this kind of separation between audiences and performers. And the performer is often very much in their own world. Mm. There's not necessarily a direct interaction or connection with their audiences or the witnesses um, who are watching their work. Which so just to expand on that briefly for the listeners that might not know, the fourth wall is to describe like a stage. So you've got the three walls behind the performers. The fourth wall is where the audience is. Yeah. So yeah, yes. go yeah. go from that. Um, whereas in live art, what I've in my experience and how I. Why I choose, why I prefer that term performance art is that it's very much trying to break down that wall um, through its performance. So it's mm. it's wants to be interactive. It has a desire to be participatory and try to involve its audiences in as many ways as possible, both in the making of it, um, whether that's the research, interviewing people toward you know, a particular subject, or um, as well as you know talking to them within the piece itself through the performance. I I very much like having that that engagement of to say this is a conversation, this is a dialogue mm. um, we're having, 
and also after the event it's quite to kind of bring your audiences with you on the journey of you as an artist and where you're going and to see future work but it's also well to go give feedback to say you know what did you think about that how did you respond what did it make you feel what where did um where did it take you or, or, mm. or what did you find it problematic and you know, do you feel you need to you 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 found it uncomfortable or you thought I didn't represent a certain part of something um, yeah. that's what I really like about live art and I think that's what I'm quite keen to do now through my, through my MA is to um, look at that role that being kind of an artist here and having a studio in the Carpenter's Estate which has this history of, of well, ongoing process of regeneration decanting how can my role within the art that I make kind of resist that create resilience um, and be kind of for people who are here mm. um, without the, the work that I'm making being co-opted by uh, higher powers as a form of art washing so it's that that interest art washing, art washing is when for example developers or local councils use art as being this um, kind of buffer and um, kind of sanitised way of hiding the the problems of social cleansing and the, um, the gentrification that's happening. So quite a good example is things like uh, murals around hoarding. Um, right, yeah. Or, yeah, <coughs> and it becomes, it, yeah, it becomes this kind of tool for often local councils and developers to be able to sell or, or kind of create this illusion of inclusion mm. um, of like working on oh, let's work with the local community around the area that they're redeveloping to make a mural um, but actually yeah but actually it's just a way of trying to kind of appeasing people's mm. anger someone was talking about murals I think it was probably a comedian who mm. was talking about it and they were talking about kind of Mid, very middle class areas where they don't get murals yeah. um, but it, you, where you get murals is in Northern Ireland or, or graffiti in certain parts of East London but it's interesting that you say that because now you've said that mm. um, I r completely recognise it yeah. Yeah. in yeah. certain parts of, parts of yeah. East London and East stuff. London and yeah places that yeah, have this kind of um, they're being contested for space yeah. Um, and different people want that space so going back to investment yeah I feel looking at I think it's, I guess to use kind of like financial terms looking at asset and be like what are the assets I have as an artist and often that is access to space um, how can I make that accessible to people who may not necessarily have that which is what I'm interested in this space particularly well it says to me that um the word investment, depending on who uses it, means different things. Because investment in local areas, when you hear it on the news and politicians talking about it, that we need investment in infrastructure and housing and social um, health care, they're talking about economics. Yes. But when you're talking about it, and, and a lot of what I'm hearing in different, in terms of performance artists, particularly from the queer community um, and different other other communities when they talk about investment they're verbalising economics but what they're really saying is that it's not about money it's about what money can give us it's about community yeah. it's about um, public space mm. it's about um social interactions um, safe havens yeah. absolutely yeah I think mostly because especially as artists we never have such kind of sizable amounts of money like mm. <laughs> like um, politicians or, uh, or local councils not to say the, the money's still there I wouldn't want to erase the fact that there's still money um, can I ask you something yeah what is your um <clears throat> what is your social class? Yeah, is oh, it? Yeah. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't how want would, to kind of how would I yeah. narrow you down, but it's, no. it, it, I, how how do I? I guess it's the the, the question there, like how do people self-identify? Yeah. If people self-identify, well, okay, two what, questions. That, yeah, what 
what social class do you come from and mm. what social class are you? Yes, so that I feel there's lots of factors to that. Most of the fact I'm, I'm, I'm a migrant, so the social class I had in Mexico was very different to what I had what I have here. Okay. So in Mexico we were middle class. I would say my dad had um, worked for a book co- American book company. Um, we lived in a very kind of yeah fairly affluent part of Mexico. But then coming to um, the UK, my father was no longer the breadwinner. My mum had to take um, take up that role. Um, and we're, I think we're very much that kind of like migrant working class, but with aspirations back to be becoming middle class. Um, right. And then now, now that I've kind of left my family, my family no longer support me. I'm then becoming what what is the class that I at, that I am now as this kind of individual, um, financial individual. And I think at the minute, it's working class. I think um, being kind of unemployed and self-employed. I, I have no income other than through the kind of benefits that I um, I'm eligible for um, mm. and through the very small pockets of money as an artist I make. Mm. Uh, but I guess I still have, I'd still ha- have that sense of kind of aspiration or that kind of history of having kind of middle class values mm. in that sense of like academia um, I guess that's probably quite a strong one. I guess now that I'm doing an MA, that would also perhaps mark me out as being yeah, not necessarily kind of in the working class. Yeah. Um, it's, it's complicated. I think it's a complex history that will change, that shifts. What's interesting is this idea of like, I think often we, well, again, I don't know enough about kind of like class studies, but if mm. it becomes a very, it feels like it becomes very essentialist. And this idea of like, if you were born working class or you come from a working class background you will always be that way and actually rather class is a process as much as any identity yeah politics yeah. that people have it's a whole. <laughs> and, it, and that can change because you know you might become bankrupt you might move to another country yeah um social you know um economic climates within your country might shift you know if you go through something if you're a communist nation suddenly you become a capitalist like my partner um, was raised in Czechoslovakia under communism and suddenly he lived through it becoming um, a capitalist oh, entering okay. a capitalist phase and suddenly that that entire men- complete change he, yeah, he's still trying to understand now about having lived through an entirely different political system so that defined he, class so he lived through Czechoslovakia as a Soviet as a, country, yeah as a Soviet state and then it breaking up into yeah to becoming its independent the, Beca- the Czech Republic and, and Slovakia. Slovakia yeah okay um, and then <laughs> and then he moved to America um, <laughs> when he was like 17 so he went yeah he's, he has had had his very kind of really lived through entirely two different political mm. systems which is something I've never lived through I've always lived in capitalism yeah um, but that's interesting so, yeah. going from that last point People, you say I've always lived within capitalism. Mm. I believe so. I think looking at my history, I but is that I the case though? Lived. I mean, it would it, it would be I within mean, the capitalist system. Yeah, I agree with that. But then, when you live in, particularly being in Mexico, I don't know much about the culture, but it it does seem to have a very particular character in terms of its community and yeah. its interactions which the little I know about it is essentially it's not capitalist mm. it's within a capitalist system yeah. but um, it's not capitalist like I know someone from a friend of mine um, from Ghana and he lives within capitalist system and I, I would say he's probably essentially a capitalist himself but the interactions with him and his family and his his Ghanaian community he travels from Ghana to here quite a lot it's not capitalist at all it's difficult to disentangle Mexico from you know its big economic neighbour the United States and how much that influence and how much we are tied to their economic system Mm. Um, I, yeah, I still see Mexico as being 
capitalists. I mean, there's lots of layers to Mexico in the sense of there is very um, on a kind of very rural indigenous level that might that, op- that operates outside. Well, yeah, not something nothing else outside of capitalism, but they were able to operate between each other. They supported communities within farming, agriculture, um, the way kind of like goods are made. Do you know much about the the native communities in in Mexico? Um, you should interview my dad. That's who you should interview. He has he he work, um, works in this kind of given kind of talks on the um, Zapatista movement. Oh, okay. Which started in um, that was quite recent, wasn't it? The nineties, yeah. So yeah. yeah, I was born just as it was like pushing, uh, pushing to um, prominence. So that's like in the south of Mexico, where because they were, I don't really know much about it, but they were quite rural. Yes, incredibly rural. Yeah, probably one of the, the but <coughs> yeah, parts closest to Guatemala, um, and they kind of have been operating like within kind of between community to community mm. um, systems and yeah feeling very disenfranchised from kind of like what was happening in like central Mexico um, in terms of the politics and how people like people's indigenous rights were being taken away or erased um, people's lands as well um, and relationship between kind of major corporations um, changing the way agriculture was being um, the kind of like traditional methods of agriculture um, by bringing in kind of new GMO crops um, and then the government saying that this is now um, the crops that you have to use and so yeah creating those kind of those tensions between how local communities had been doing things for a long time and that had been working for them with new um, kind of government uh, policy mm. and then that then creating this kind of movement to seek kind of separation and independence autonomy I think it's more for them it's very much about uh, wanting to become autonomous mm. um, yeah. the reason I ask and this is quite a digression but I find it so interesting this it was a Mexican guy that I met in in Denmark yeah. He moved there about eight years ago. Um, he was talking about his family that moved to Los Angeles. A lot of his family, I think most of his family now, moved to Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And he was talking about his grandfather, um, who spoke Nahuatl. Yeah. Um, and to be able to get work in the city he had to learn Spanish yeah. but then he was talking about his younger brother every time he speaks to him because his young brother's in Los Angeles with his family every time he speaks to him he tries to speak to him in Spanish and even though the whole family comes from Mexico his younger brother refuses to speak in Spanish yeah he only speaks in English, in English yeah language yeah is this kind of something that we tackle with a lot especially in Mexico indigenous languages like Nahuatl and Mayan and um, Zapotec are definitely dwindling um, and Spanish is still this kind of language that has this history that we've we've also managed to kind of adapt and take Spanish and create kind of our own form I say not form but it's like we have our own dialect and a certain kind of way of um, uh, of sense syntax of sentence structure is different from kind of Castilian Spanish mm. um, and I noticed this very I didn't quite realise this until I moved to England um, and I my parents um, in order because obviously arriving here in the UK the, the, the Spanish speaking community was very um again very non-existent also because uh, the migrant community of people from Spain hadn't arrived yet um, post like 2008 um, so no one spoke Spanish especially in Birmingham you know there's no Spanish community so I didn't need I only really spoke it with my father at that point 
Mm-hmm. Um, so my parents decided to send me to the only school in Birmingham secondary school that taught at GCSE because it would be an easy GCSE for me. So obviously I arrived and, and I, what I didn't realise, well, I should have figured it out that I was going to be taught Castilian Spanish. So actually, so it was this <coughs> in, really interesting being in this class and having this problem of being told you don't know how to speak Spanish. Can you say what Castilian Spanish is? It is, I yeah. So for me, Castilian Spanish has is the to kind of use a kind of parallel. It's the kind of the Ox, Oxford Cambridge English. So turning up at secondary school and thinking that I was going to get a easy GCSE, and then having mm. been confronted with this kind of like wave of um, how different is bizarre. it from? Mexican it's not too Spanish. different. I mean, I could, of course we can all understand <laughs> each other. Um, um, but when it comes to things like pronunciation, pronunciation is different. Um, right. The way you formulate words, uh, formulate uh, sentences, um, is longer in Castilian. I think um, a lot of Central and South American Spanish um, simplified a lot of Castilian. Okay. Um, but also, also the meaning of certain words uh, in Castilian and other Spanish other Spanish dialects is quite different mm. um, often quite radical quite radical ways I'm trying to think of an example um, so uh, the word to get in Spanish in Castilian Spanish coger in um, in Mexican Spanish means to fuck <laughs> <laughs> so there was this great moment when I get off the plane um, <laughs> Having, having been in England for like X amount of years, not having, you know, seen my Mexican family in southern Mexico, uh, first time I've, you know, been back in six, you know, maybe six, eight years, yeah. and get in the car from the airport, and my auntie asked me, so who's going to get you from uh, the airport when you, uh, <laughs> when you return back to the UK? <laughs> and obviously I use, I use the Castilian, Castilian, because that's in my head. That's yeah. I've been rewired to yeah. s- to speak that, um, and she turns around in the back of the car and says, "We're in Mexico. You have to say recoger." <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, yeah. So that, I, I'll always remember that. Cause I think yeah. it's quite good. Um, that, but and it's what, I mean, that's what's fascinating isn't it, about kind of like this kind of like the fact colon- colonialism is still a process. And it becomes complicated if you, 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 yeah, it's a process we all have to go through when you go, whenever you're, because through kind of globalization of moving between mm. different places and learning one way of doing things and then suddenly learning about the history of the way you've been taught that um, and going somewhere else and then being confronted again with yeah. another, another, another wave of people saying that's not the way to do something particularly in language I think it's quite interesting so then see, seeing how your your friend I can I can I can relate to that mm. the fact that he as your friend's family now they've moved to another country the dominant language there is English um, mm. that's what's gonna that's what's going to get them the job but it's also it's, I think I think it's very much kind of adopting the or attempting to adopt or in tempting to culturally invest in the new country that you come from, yeah, mm-hmm. and viewing, like viewing his own kind of cultural heritage as, um, kind of not valuable. Yeah, that's, I suppose. Well, I, my perspective of being particularly Mexican within the United States is that because there's such a large demographic. As a large communities mm. um, in various parts of the the US, you would feel you wouldn't need that. My potential. I think would it's quite need particular to. amongst the younger Mexican community. Yeah, that they have to. They're being forced to subscribe to being American, and being American well, is I, not. I, I think it's interesting. I don't. I don't think it's necessarily <laughs> that they're they're forced to do it, but they they see the the value in becoming American I think it's to do with capitalism as well the way that capitalism kind of offers this 
richness and its opportunities. Yeah. They say, I'm, I'm Mexican, but I want that. Yes. I want the riches that they have, and I want the money and the girls and the what have you, and yeah. the drugs and the and the food Whatever and the aspiration. Yeah, all the yeah, all the aspirational stuff. In some way, I've always been quite envious of kind of like Mexicans in the United States um, are called um, Chicanos um, because I've heard the, that, right? yeah. So so they have, they have a, a whole narrative now, discourse around that identity formulating of being both Mexican American. Um, which is something that I, I've always been really interested in, which is something I can't identify with because I've never lived in the United States, not mm. grown up there. But I feel there's lots, I feel there's things I can borrow from that to, um, mm. to understand like what it means to be kind of Mexican British. So in your in sense, yeah. In your work, how how much or do you at all consider the language in terms of your work? Yeah. Um, is it something you think about consciously? Occasionally. Part of me wants to say that because I'm kind of more fluent in, because I use English more, I, I think it's di more difficult to express myself in Spanish mm. because I've forgotten, or because I, it's not in, it's not, I don't use it so much. But occasionally I definitely use, I guess Spanglish, I guess I'm interested in this kind of like third mm -hmm. form of this way of, um, this mix, this combination of both. Um, mm. In terms of your performance of The Holiest Death, yeah. um, I suppose we can re return to the concept of opacity. Yeah. That even though it's not a verbal performance, even though it's very visual, the facts that that character, that deity comes from Mexico and, and the levels of the, the, the history where she came from and what yeah. it means today when people saw it unless you're familiar with that you don't know the con Spanish connection yeah. or you don't know the Mexican connection um, and even if you do which I recognise the Hispanic mm. connection I couldn't s I couldn't see where it comes from I couldn't give any real texture to it other than what you were expressing at the time yeah how did you come across um, the, that character character uh, Santa Muerte yes I was in I've kind of I've always kind of known about her through mostly through kind of media at the time in Mexico um, but I think it was only quite recently going back two years ago and being in Mexico City and actually visiting some some shrines um, and talking to some people there that it just became more I started to become more fascinated, particularly in kind of her relationships to communities. Um, because I mean, the kind of like cult, like the cult of like death and our kind of understanding of death within Mexico is because of things like um, uh, Day of the Dead, the de los Muertos. Um, that is kind of recognised uh, and practised by kind of all kind of levels of society in Mexico. That I was interested in, kind of like, well, why is this kind of considered? Um, marginal or or um, unconventional I think it's from that then I th then I thought um, what is that how can I, I kind of explore that is a can I make work about this mm -hmm. um, and then and then it just comes through research I think then comes through kind of reading and watching um, and listening to people talk about about her in particular that mm -hmm. yeah it's just kind of thinking more about it um, but then a the difficult thing is then like finding there to be like well then how how not only not some the problem of making work but then like where do you show it and then when I saw the call out for from um, contemporary um, about uh, the underworld I was a bit like oh perfect yeah of course in, in my application I was talking about the un the underworld as being this social class of being this, her devotees are relate she is the patron saint of the underworld not uh, both um, simultaneously yeah. Yeah. the um, the afterlife underground uh, death but also this social class that's not um, that's not dominant that's not uh, that's considered yeah 
Mind you. you know what? I, I could get another two hours yes. out of you, but we've got to. <laughs> you, you've yeah, got, got to go, go to your next go meeting. So meeting. thank you very no much. No worries. Thank you, Toby. Thanks for so performing podcast. It's always a pleasure talking with Seb about his work and his heritage. There's so much I can learn about both, and I will be returning at some point in the future to talk to him about his future projects. But please remember he is performing at the Camden People's Theatre in Starting Blocks on the 17th of March with other artists and performers. Next week's episode is with fellow podcaster, storyteller, and the author of his new book, Mansplaining Masculinity, Dave Pickering. This book is taken from a show he did where, dressed in a purple dress, fedora hat, and holding his old dolphin toy, he tackles the subject of masculinity, directing his rhetoric towards men. His other podcasts include Getting Better Acquainted, a show he's been doing for over six years. His next episode, featuring a certain me, will be published this Wednesday, where he talks to me about my podcast. It's not as meta as it sounds, but we did interview each other on the same day. His other podcast is The Family Tree, an improvised drama. Not much can be said about this other podcast other than it's gripping.